welcome to the last installment in our four-part series on emerging immunotherapeutic agents for the treatment of bladder cancer. Today, Dr. Robert Zvatek and Dr. Angela Smith will be discussing complex patient cases in bladder cancer. I will now turn it over to Dr. Robert Zvatek. Uh, welcome, everyone. We have this complex patient cases in bladder cancer. The, fa- the faculty that will be hosting tonight's presentation is Dr. Angela Smith. Dr. Smith is, uh, uh, comes to us from uh, University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill School of Medicine. She is in the Department of Urology, and she is a, a board-certified urologist at the UNC Leinberger Comprehensive Cancer Center, where she treats genital urinary malignancies with a special expertise in bladder cancer. Dr. Smith has a background in health services research and biostatistics with particular interest in patient-centered outcomes research. She is funded by an AHRQ grant focusing on improving postoperative care through health information technology. She's also received funding from PCORI to improve patient engagement in bladder cancer. She serves on the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Initiative an advisory panel representing clinicians. The AUA would like to thank the following companies for providing educational grants in support of this webinar. AstraZeneca, bristol Myers Squibb, Genentech, and Merck. At this point, I'd like to turn the program over to Dr. Smith. Angie? Yeah, thanks, Rob. Thanks for having me. Um, Again, this is Complex Patient Cases in Bladder Cancer. It's going to be a dialogue between Rob and myself and, again, um, taking questions as we go. Uh, Our activity goal for this application-based activity is to review patient cases associated with the treatment of bladder cancer to assist learners to apply this information into clinical practice. We have several learning objectives. At the completion of this activity, the learner will be able to design a comprehensive treatment plan for patients with bladder cancer that incorporates immune and checkpoint inhibitors and prepare patients for the emergence of treatment-related adverse effects through accurate patient education. So with that, I'm going to start us off with our first case, and we'll alternate cases as we move along. Um, The first one is going to be focused on upper tract urothelial cancer, and This was a patient who came to me uh, about a year ago or so. He's 88 years old. Uh, He had a history of non-invasive low-grade bladder cancer that was diagnosed two years prior to his presentation, Um, but he presented now with hematuria. Uh, Most significant regarding his past medical history was that he had severe or aortic stenosis. He otherwise had no surgeries in in his history um, and actually had some excellent functional status despite the aortic stenosis. He was active. He hiked... um, you know, uh, led a, a fairly uh, um, active and full life. His recent stress test was negative for ischemia, and his life expectancy was greater than three years um, per his cardiologist. So I began with uh, what you might imagine, some surveillance cystoscopy, and that demonstrated tumor overlying the right ureter orifice. Um, then I, uh, you know, had him undergo a CT scan, and that showed severe right hydroureter nephrosis. You can see that. Um, the upper tract here in the left, lower left um, image, and then uh, questionable upper tract malignancy. It's hard to see on this screen, but if you blew it up, um, this ureter on the right side um, has some, uh, what appears to be some filling defects uh, there. So I took him for TRBT uh, to take care of the bladder tumor and hopefully to survey or um, investigate that upper tract. Uh, we were able to get a complete resection of the bladder and intravesical mitomycin C was given in recovery. However, during the case, uh, we were unable to uh, perform ureteroscopy. We couldn't locate the ureteral orifice. We had resected over it, and despite our best attempts, um, including indigo, we couldn't um, we couldn't find it. So the pathology had came back uh, low grade TA, and I and I, I failed to mention also during the case itself, uh, the anesthesiologist had mentioned this was very challenging. Uh, the patient had very labile blood pressure, was hypotensive. Was very, it was very difficult to get him through surgery. So we knew the next step, um, especially with the, the fact that there was questionable filling de- defect of the upper tract, that we wanted to investigate the upper tract in some way um, and wanted to perform diagnostic ureteroscopy. But since we were unable to locate the UO from retrograde approach, uh, we uh, had a nephrostomy tube placed that was subsequently internalized to an indwelling stent, 
And then we scheduled his diagnostic ureteroscopy for three weeks later, and we were able to easily identify the UO with the stent in place. And um, when we performed ureteroscopy, we noted a high-volume um, tumor basically throughout his kidney and ureter, so the right upper pole calyx, the renal pelvis, and then the mid-distal ureter, so quite a bit of, um, of, of tumor, certainly not something we could have uh, taken uh, fulgurated or resected at one go. So we decided to biopsy these. Um, I, I ended up biopsying several different areas and sent these individually. I also did cytology washings um, and brushings. I guess at this point I, it's important to, to think about, you know, when you're going in, if you're going to do a cytology, um, you know, you want to make sure that you're not using contrast ahead of time uh, so that you can get the best specimen possible. So we did that. Angie, uh-huh, sure. so, um, you know, I... I struggle with getting good tissue from these upper tract cases. Any tips or tricks to what, what, what do you use? Do you use the, the big opsy or just the regular um, ureteroscopic forceps and any tri- yeah. you know, tricks on getting good, good tissue? Yeah, that's a challenge for, for, for me as well. Um, I have used the big opsy in the past. I haven't, I'll be honest, I haven't had great luck with it. Um, However, um, I think in certain situations it can be useful. Um, I, I generally, my, my go-to at first is using some piranhas, um, especially if I have a papillary tumor that I can easily get. Um, if I know that I, I need to get really good tissue, sometimes I'll pre-place a, um, a, a sheath so that I can pull everything out, sometimes pulling the specimen through your ureteroscope uh, it, it dislodges um, and you don't get as good tissue as you'd like to get. The other thing that I've found works pretty well is using um, a basket, uh, you know, what we usually use for a stone um, procedure, so a basket, a ureteral basket. And um, I've been able to get that, especially those that are on that stalk, you can kind of get that um, basket around it. And yeah. I've actually gotten the best tissue that way. But, again, you have to have the right tumor that sort of, um, papillary with a small stalk, et cetera. Um, I, I like to just cover all my bases, so I still will get cytology washings every time, um, and I also get brushings because I have had, I'm sure we all have had um, episodes where we take a, a small bit of tumor and it just doesn't survive processing because these are tiny um, fragments of tissue. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I, you know, I tell the residents, I say, you know, you can never get too many biopsies in upper tract. It's like, Get cytology, get brushings. Do it, just keep you doing it as much as you can because it's sometimes hard to find the specimen. So yeah, and especially in this patient, I, I really didn't want to have to put him back to sleep. Yeah. I wanted to have the answer right then and there. So um, yeah. so yeah, so that's what we did, and uh, we replaced the stent and we removed his nephrostomy tube. He was having um, you know he's having a lot of pain within that. Like I said, he's an active guy. He, he really didn't want to have a tube there. So. You know, as I mentioned, all the specimens returned low-grade TA, and the problem with this patient was that he was symptomatic. He had hematuria that was precluding him from doing what he needed to do. He was ending up in the ER with clot retention, and from for all intents and purposes, we knew that this was coming from the upper tract at this point. So, you know, I was trying to think, uh, you know, between these different options, you know, do I take him for a radical nephrodurethectomy? Um, do I attempt endoscopic ablation? Do I observe? Do I do a clinical trial? And, um, Rob, if this was a healthy patient, you know, somebody who had two healthy kidneys, no issues, what, what would you do, um, you know, if that yeah, were the I, case? Yeah, so, I, you know, with low grade, I tend to do everything I can to save the system, to save the collecting system. Um, but the difference in this case is that it's just such high volume. I mean, when you, you're talking about, multiple calyces, the ureter, um, I think, you know, the right thing to do is a nephro U. Um, had it been one calyx, had it been just the renal pelvis, uh, had it been something, you know, e- even if it's in, let's say, a couple of calyces, I would try to go um, percutaneously and do, a, you know, it's almost using the, ret- the resectoscope and resect them in the upper tract with low-grade disease be- you know, because I want to save the, the renal unit. But I just don't think you have a, a great option other than nephro And, and, and if this, in this particular case, the patient's not a good candidate for surgery. So it's, it's a really tough thing. Um, so clinical trial, 
Um, if you can't do a Nepro U, we just have to be creative. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's, that's how I feel as well. I think one important point to, to, to mention here is that, you know, I didn't mention uh, earlier, but if you, if you recall the, the CT scan, he had a pretty um, thin parenchyma in that kidney. So I did get a DMSA to get a sense of split function, and I think that can be very helpful. Because if you have a patient with, you know, 10% function, uh, and this high volume tumor, I think you, you know, you really do have your answer. But in, in some cases that, you know, I, I do try to spare the kidney if possible. Again, percutaneous approach, especially if it's high volume. But as you mentioned, this, it, this was not possible in this patient. In fact, any anesthesia was a real risk for him. Um, you know, I, I, I can't even, you know, I, I can't even say how difficult even just Doing that ureteroscopy was getting him off the table. Every time I had to have a very um, specific conversation about the risk of anesthetic for him. So um, I did speak to the cardiologist for this patient to find out if he would clear him for an FR ureterectomy, and he did. He wouldn't, and that was probably the right answer there. Um, and as I mentioned, I, I didn't feel like I could actually uh, respect all of that tumor, and so uh, and and. If I could do it, it would have to be multiple anesthetics to actually get that completely, you know, done. And so, um, fortunately, there was an investigational drug that uh, that I had heard of from a um, from a colleague, and this was um, essentially uh, this novel sustained release thermo reversible gel, and it it can be um, coupled with certain medications like mitomycin C. And so the interesting thing about this particular drug is that it's a liquid at lower temperatures, but then it becomes a gel at body temperature. And, um, and, and even more so, it devol- dissolves about, uh, upon contact with urine. So it, it really makes it ideal, ideally suited for the upper tract. You know, mitomycin C, if we can give it, we, we like to give it. Um, but as you might imagine, you put the mitomycin C in the upper tract and it comes right back down. Um, it really doesn't get the dwell time that it needs. Uh, so this was an opportunity to try putting that drug in the system for an extended period of time um, and allowing it to come back out. So um, I thought this was potentially a good option for him, and I, I explained this to him. Uh, he elected to undergo this mitomycin C gel treatment, and um, the way that this is done, it's, it's done very similar to DCG or mitomycin C for the, uh, for the lower tract. It's done as an induction course for six weeks followed by maintenance every three to six months. Uh, again, we did this as compassionate use, but I'll mention that it's currently being offered now in the United States as a phase three multi-center trial, but I believe it's um, available in Europe right now. So in terms of the first treatment, um, we did perform that under conscious sedation. Uh, we weren't sure how he was going to, um, you know, to tolerate that. Uh, we noted several small bladder tumors at the time. Uh, we resected those, and then we decided to place this drug uh, retrograde, although you can actually also place it anterograde through a percutaneous nephrostomy tube. But we thought for this patient it would be, uh, it would be, it would make the most sense going retrograde since you could place it in the upper tract and then pull back your, your, your ureteral stent as you inject the drug down the ureter. And so we measured the volume of the renal pelvis three times and it averaged to about 11 milliliters. Um, he had a slightly larger renal pelvis because he was obstructed for a while, um, although we had relieved that obstruction. Uh, the volume of the ureter is generally 4 milliliters. Um, we used that uh, with the drug concentration of 60 milligrams per, mil, for, per 15 mils. And we uh, placed that. The white count, uh, we always check the white count when we do these. Uh, it was 8.4. His creatinine was stable, 1.3. And we, we had him stay overnight uh, just to make sure that he didn't have immediate side effects, which he did not. So um, fast forward to the second treat, a treatment a week later, we uh, obtained some labs. We noted the white count had um, had, had decreased, uh, but again, this is a known side effect of this gel treatment, uh, namely the mitomycin C in the gel treatment. And um, the patient complained of some mild fatigue or nausea for the first couple days, but that resolved. And so we did this awake, and he tolerated just fine. And then we brought him back for the third treatment. At this point, um, his white count had um, decreased a little further to three. He tolerated this treatment, but uh, two days later, he had pretty significant fatigue and nausea, and it became a little concerned. So we decided to hold further treatment. We got some new labs and brought him back. 
And um, his lab showed severe neutropenia at this point, uh, as well as thrombocytopenia. We, the, first, the first thing that I needed to do was roll out obstruction. Uh, I wanted to make sure that, that the mitomycin C was actually excreted as we had, you know, um, expected, to it, expected it to be. Um, and, and we did, we were able to rule that out. Uh, we actually had to, because he had um, memory hydro, uh, it was kind of difficult to, to know for sure. We ended up placing a percutaneous nephrostomy tube temporarily just to make sure that he was completely drained. Um, we admitted him for observation, and he did receive neupogen. And then his white count started to trend upwards, and he recovered well. Uh, and then, you know, we, we had him come back about three months later to um, take a look in. He didn't want to do ure- ureteroscopy, and he decided not to do any kind of um, anesthetic. So we did this actually with him awake. And uh, the retrograde, it was it looked – I don't have a pre-retrograde um, – to show you, but it, it, it looked tremendously better. Um, and we didn't see any obvious residual tumor, either in the bladder or at least on retrograde. Um, and most importantly, is, is he, his hematuria had resolved. So I felt this was a success um, in the sense that, you know, we were, again, treating his symptoms. And this is an 88-year-old male with low-grade upper tract, you know, biopsy proven. And sometimes that is the answer um, in these specific patients, perhaps not the healthy patient with two healthy kidneys, but um, I think it's important, this is an important lesson to really think through what your, the goal is for your patient, because sometimes you have to think outside the box to get that right. Angie, so just to address mm-hmm. a couple of questions, um, uh, can you clarify, is mitomycin available, is the mitomycin gel of commercially available in the U.S.? Um, n- no, it's not available as of yet. Um, right now it's um, being tested in a phase three multi-center trial. Um, and uh, that's really the only way uh, to use it here in the U.S. right now. Um, but I know they have intentions of um, of making it available um, once they, re- you know, they they have the results of the trial. And um, you, you mentioned that the way that you installed it was through a ure- um, through retrograde through a stent. Mm-hmm. Can it be instilled mm-hmm. through a nephrostomy tube? Or it, yeah, it, it can. Um, yeah, in fact, we discussed this. I uh, discussed this with the company in terms of what, you know, which approaches were possible. And absolutely can be done through a nephrostomy tube. Um, in my mind, the, the probably the best scenarios where nephrostomy tubes make sense are those that have renal pelvis tumors or, you know, or specifically in an upper pole calyx or a lower pole calyx, somewhere where, you, where it's in the kidney. Um, and, and that's one. And then two, uh, someone who might have an obstruction um, distally, or you're worried that the, the, that the medication may not, um, may not drain effectively. Uh, we chose retrograde in this case because we wanted to pull down that stent as we injected the, the mitomycin C gel. And so um, that was why we chose retrograde in this particular case. But you can do it both um, depending on the scenario. I guess it just seems... Um Mm-hmm. more of a, an inconvenience and more just more manipulation to have to go retrograde. You have to scope them and, and insert. It does. So it just seems like <laughs> if it could be done. Yeah, as you know, you did it. So. I know, I know. I mean, I have to be there every week, at the same time every week um, doing it. But, yeah. um, but you know, I think – I think that again, it's, if you can get that down the ureter, I feel I feel a lot more confident that I'm treating the ureter in that scenario um, versus yeah. placing it in the nephrostomy tube and, and hoping that it, you know, it, it liquefies and then you know drains out. I don't know really how much the ureter is being treated. So I think in this particular case, it, I really needed to do a retrograde approach to um, effectively treat him. Uh, another question is, how long does it take for the gel to, to dissolve, mm-hmm. and should a ureteral stent be le- left in place? to prevent obstruction by the gel. I would say you don't want to leave a stent in place because it won't allow the gel to accumulate. Um, right. So I assume that it, it dissolves pretty quickly. Um, or, yeah, it dissolves yeah. over a period of two to three hours. Um, the urine okay. dissolves it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, well, that, that's, that's terrific. Well, I can't wait to see the results of this uh, uh, um, trial. And, you know, we need more agents available to us for upper tract. We just don't have a lot in our armamentarium. So uh, I know it took a lot for you to get this trial approved at UNC and to do this, so I commend you for all that work. And, um, you know, we'll look forward to
the results. So we're going to move to the next case. Um, this is a 55, uh, sorry, a 55 year old male who is evaluated for hematuria, otherwise healthy male, and uh, the cytology is positive for high grade urethelial cells. Uh, an IVP was performed, which was normal. The cystoscopy found a papillary tumor and an erythematous patch. Biopsy confirms high grade TA and uh, carcinoma in situ. So, Angie, pretty straightforward case. Um, would you give mitomycin in the post-operative period for this? Uh, do you do it routinely? Do you use CISQ yeah. routinely? And how would you manage this patient? Okay. So, um, yeah, I, I do. For this particular patient, I would go ahead and give mitomycin C. I don't, I'm not certain what they have um, at the outset. So, um, per AUA guidelines, I think, you know, it's, it's perfectly, you know, reasonable and should be given. Um, I do think CISU can be helpful, and I personally use it in my practice for everyone who I have any question of, um, especially, you know, if I see papillary tumors, you know, patch of erythema. I think CISU does its best job for detecting CIS. So if that's going to improve my ability to detect that and biopsy specific um, suspicious lesions, um, I use it. So I don't see the downside there. Um, and I can't remember your third question. <laughs> Sorry. Um, oh, how would you manage this patient? What would you? What would your oh, so high grade yeah. PA personal? Yeah, patient? you know, um, I think this is probably a good time to talk about. It. And I'm actually going to ask you a question, Rob. Um, uh, yeah. This is a high grade TA. Let me get you back here. Um, high grade TA. Uh, you know, generally speaking, we when we see high grade, let's say T1, I think that's a no brainer. You have high grade T1, you're going to re resect them. But I think it's a little more controversial or um, I don't know if that's the right word. Some, some folks believe maybe having high-grade TA with a complete resection doesn't need a re-resection if you have lamina propria, but perhaps no, no muscle um, present or muscle is present and negative. Would you re-resect this patient? I think that's, that's a question for you. Yeah. So I, I think um, for the audience, anybody with T1, High grade T1, uh, you have to do re-resection. No, no, no controversy on that. We all agree on that. A high grade TI, TA, I personally handle um, on a case by case basis. So, if I, you know, I, I, we take pictures before and after, and if I uh, feel that I adequately got the tumor, it's on a stalk, I can see muscle fibers, um, and I feel confident then I, I don't feel like I need to go back and do another re-resection on that. On the other hand, there are some tumors where you think they're T1 or, you may, you know, you, you know you think you're going to have to go back. It turns out it's TA and you're not sure that you got everything. Then in that case, I, I go back to make sure. So I, case by case basis. Um, I just yeah. wanted to, does that sound about what you do? Yeah, that's mm -hmm. exactly yeah. what I do. It's case by case, and there are some patients with high grade TA. I I don't re resect if I feel confident yeah. I got it all. I wanted to make a kind of a a mention of uh, post operative installation. Uh, Ed Messing presented data at the AUA this year, uh, and actually Andy, you 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 um, presented this in the take home points. Is um, Jim Cytobine was shown to prevent tumor recurrence has used immediate post-operative installation. So mm -hmm. um, in the near future, we're going to have uh, the option of using mitomycin C or gemcitabine. We're actually ordering it to be used at our hospital. The advantage of gemcitabine is that it may be less um, side effects in terms of the uh, irritation to the skin, uh, whereas, you know, mitomycin can be irritative and, and sometimes can cause Irritated symptoms of the bladder afterward. It also, gemcitabine also is slightly uh, less expensive in our site. So, uh, gemcitabine may be something to, to include in the post-operative insulation period. Yeah, that's a great point. Yeah, we're also we're also adding this to our uh, list as well. So, um, so you asked me what I would do. So I'll, I'll, oh. I will answer your last question. <laughs> and. Um, you, you have it here, actually. I think that when you see that erythematous patch um, and the uh, positive cytology, um, many of those will resolve. So I actually move them um, through to maintenance. I don't biopsy it. 
Um, and in fact, that's what the guidelines support as well. Um, you know, I, I, Rob, I assume, you know, I assume that you pr- most likely do the same thing. Um, yes, yeah. Is that right? That's yeah. right, yeah. I think, so, uh, um, you know, I, yeah, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no, I, I was just going to say I'm a strong uh, proponent of maintenance therapy. Um, I, uh, and I know there's this whole body of, of argument out there about using induction, but um, I think I'm going to go to my next slide because I think I, yeah. So this is what I really want to emphasize is that, you know, we, we have, you know, in, in the field of urology, we have a handful of drugs that have been tested in randomized controlled trials, right? And, uh, you know, this is one drug that has been shown to have a huge benefit when used in maintenance. Uh, and if you look here, this is the results from this uh, large trial that compared maintenance therapy versus induction alone. Um, 77 months recurrence-free survival versus 37. I mean, there's just not a lot of drugs that we use that can do that kind of, uh, provide that type of benefit. So I think for people to come along and look at observational cohort data and try to make a, an argument for using induction only is just um, uh, really, really not understanding what's, what, what, what the value of this randomized control trial provides. And I think it's, um, uh, uh, I think there is certainly something to be said for new trials that are coming out looking at one year maintenance for three years. Sure, there, there's additional trials and different, edu- you know, different things we can learn from that, but. Um, in the meantime, my kind of standard is induction plus maintenance, and I'll give the full regimen if patients can tolerate it. Rob, whenever um, you have a patient, I'm sorry to um, interrupt, but I think that some, you know, I think all of us face this when we're treating our patients with maintenance, um, that sometimes they they have trouble making it through, you know, their, their 36 months. Um, do you have any tricks, so anything you do to... Um, you know, do you reduce dose, and what do you do to try to get patients through? Because I, I know I sometimes struggle with that uh, with certain patients. Yeah. And so, and in this study, to to um, to that point, 16% of patients actually got the full regimen. I mean, that's a lot of patients were not able to get the full 36 month regimen. Um, here, here's the the challenges are that. Um, it, the, the side effects tend to be cumulative, so after more and more BCG, the patients have less tolerability. The patients kind of uh, lose the uh, sense of need for the drug when they don't have a diagnosis of tumor. So that's another thing, you know, kind of motivating them to come off. Um, as far as the providers go, BCG doesn't reimburse, uh, reimburse very well. It's almost, in, in our practice, almost a... Uh, we, we lose money when we give BCG, so there's a, a disincentive to, to treat. So um, you got to fight those things. But for me, I mean, dose reduction is one uh, one way of doing it. And I, I'll typically do things like go to a half dose, go to a third or a fourth dose. Um, there are some providers that will go even to one tenth of the dose. Um, it, it, the side effects are, are bad. I think a lot of this is just interaction with the patient. Um, reassuring them, managing their symptoms. If they're predominantly irritative symptoms, you could start um, an anticholinergic. Um, I make sure that we check urine cultures. I, I make sure there's no, ab- no evidence of infection. And um, I reassure them that once we're done with the BCG, the three-week regimen of maintenance, that those sim- their symptoms will improve. And I do have some patients that have severe symptoms that we've really had to pull them off uh, BCG treatment. Rob, there's a question, um, there's actually two questions, but I'll take this first, uh, this most recent one. Um, there's a question about the shortages of BCG in the past couple of years and how, you know, what, do, what, do you, what have you done about that? Um, do you still give maintenance? You know, how did you address that um, in that setting? Yeah. So um, th- there's a recent uh, New England Journal write-up about drug shortages, and they emphasize it's specifically on BCG. I'm, um, encourage everybody to take a look at that. Just published this summer. Uh, it's a huge deal. And now that the, um, the, the one of two manufacturers has decided that they're not going to provide the product, it's become. And they, they made this decision in November or released the decision in November of 2016. So it's becoming a, a bigger and, and more of a uh, more pressing problem. Um, 
Well, I've had, in the past, I've had patients that have gone to Mexico to seek BCG treatment. I've had patients that have, uh, have been forced to get a cystectomy because there's no BCG available. Um, there are some tricks and things. So one is sharing the BCG. So if you, you use a vial, you can give a half dose and split it between two patients. You can give a third dose and split it between three patients. At one point in time, we, we would basically, if we had four patients on uh, therapy, all get, let's say we take lower risk patients getting maintenance, we would split the dose between a, a group of four patients, for example. Prioritizing your high risk patients um, to get the induction BCG is, is critical. And so we have, you know, high-grade T, T1 or CIS patients needing induction prioritized for them. Um, other strategies would be using other intravesical therapies. Mitomycin C has been used, is effective. Um, and um, there is uh, stability. The BCG is extremely stable. So if you don't use it one day, you can keep it in the fridge and use it the next day. It's not, these are not in guidelines. These are not things that, you know, you'll find in the product insert. Uh, but these are strategies that we've adopted in desperate times. Mm-hmm. Yeah, thanks, Rob. And, um, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, did you want to address the other question? I saw another one there. I, yeah, I was going to say, I think this kind of moves along the case as well. But um, someone had asked, you know, if you have a patient with focal erythema following BCG induction and a history of CIS, at what point would you be worried about BCG refractory disease, when when might you consider reinduction? So, let me see if I understand. So, you have a focal erythema following induction in history mm-hmm. of CIS. Um, so, so we I mean, had said that the, you know we waited three months, and you know yeah. when when would you be worried? So, I mean, I think erythema is you know, yeah. And let let me I'm going to come to that because I'm going to go to this next yeah. part here. And yeah, I think it can, is along the case. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So this patient has a cystoscopy at three months. The papillary lesion is gone. There's no new papillary lesions. There's this erythematous red spot. And you're at three months now. The patient has just gotten induction BCG. Um, and so this is uh, actually one of the test questions. So what do you do in this situation? Do you biopsy it? Do you wait? Um, the cytology is positive. What is the management strategy? And so um, the emphasis here is that you just wait. Okay, we know that a certain number of patients with CIS will um, respond to that additional maintenance cycle of BCG. And so if you go and biopsy now and you see CIS, it, it doesn't necessarily help you. You need to give that additional maintenance course of BCG and then evaluate it six months. And at six months, if there, if there still are erythematous patch or their cytology is positive, you need to do a biopsy at six months. This is becoming more important because there's BCG uh, unresponsive clinical trials out there, and to be eligible for them, you have to have uh, received an adequate amount of BCG, which includes not only induction but maintenance too. So just giving a patient induction means you're going to compromise their ability to get on a trial for BCG unresponsive disease. All right, so this patient... um, and no biopsies performed, as, as we said, we got the first round of maintenance BCG has started. And then at six months, the lesion, the erythematous lesion has disappeared, but the cytology remains positive. You do bilateral retrogrades, you do ureteral washings, as you should. You do random bladder biopsies, but, uh, and, and they're negative. What's the management here? The, 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 the reason I presented this case is to say you miss one thing. You need to do prostatic urethral biopsies. And um, that was the problem in this particular patient. The prostatic urethra was not assessed. That was the source of the positive cytology. Patient went back and had prostatic urethral biopsies that showed invasion into the stroma. Uh, Angie, what's your management strategy here? Is there a role? Let, let's let's pr- provide two scenarios. One scenario is there's stroma invasion like we have here. Mm-hmm. What if the patient had never had BCG and just had surface Urethelial. Can you do a TUR followed by BCG in that case? And yeah, I think and, and yeah. It, yeah. yeah. So I think yeah, those are two completely separate scenarios. If I had a patient who, you know, I had done 
you know, I looked at, you know, we found some CIS in the bladder at the same time. We had done these prosthetic biopsies. We found some surface, you know, um, involvement. That's a different scenario, and I would I would favor um, BCG, but before I did that, I would do a TUR um, to sort of open up that area. There's some evidence that that provides um, some opening for the BCG to have um, more effect. So I do that pretty routinely for those kinds of patients. Um, the second scenario that you mentioned, the one that's presented here, is stroma invasion, whether that's after what this patient's already had, which is BCG, or whether it was presented earlier. You know, stromal invasion um, indicates a pretty poor prognosis. So I, for those patients, I really just move directly to cystoprostatectomy, and I make sure I get urethral margins at the time as well. And what do you do, Rob? Terrific. Yep, yep, I'm, I'm right with you. So, um, and um, sometimes we'll do a urethrectomy depending on, you know, whether or not the, how, how extensive the urethral involvement is. Uh, mm-hmm. Jordan has asked a question. So he wants to clarify why, so in this case, patient has a, the three-month cysto shows the uh, erythematous lesion. Why give maintenance, three weeks maintenance instead? Uh, why not give induction? And so, Jordan, it's a good question, and what I want to really emphasize here is, remember, BCG is an immune therapy. Um, BCG uh, stimulates the immune system to respond, and just because you're seeing an erythematous patch at three months does not mean that the patient's not responding. Um, BCG, uh, immune therapy sometimes takes a while to see the activity. Um, Maybe the erythematous patch is smaller. Maybe the immune system is gearing up. Um, and that additional maintenance course can eradicate uh, um, the CIS in, in the vast majority of cases. So you could do another induction course. It's just not necessary and, and not, would not be the, the kind of the recommended way of proceeding. It's just the patient has CIS. Um, oftentimes you need the induction plus maintenance to, to eradicate it. So I want to... Uh, just emphasize the answer to this question here. If the stroma is involved, we would do a radical cystoprostatectomy. If the stroma is not involved, it's just on the surface, not involving the ducts, not involving the asini of the prostate, then a, 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 a transurethral resection of the prostate and BCG would be appropriate had the patient not received any prior BCG. So the patient underwent a radical cystoprostatectomy, um, nodes negative, uh, the um, no tumor in the bladder, and uh, we're going to move now to case number three. So um, this is a 70-year-old female with muscle invasive bladder cancer. Uh, it's an aggressive type. She's got lymphovascular invasion, which we, we know is a, uh, an adverse prognostic feature. She's got right-sided hydronephrosis, also an adverse prognostic feature. Um, the problem is that she also has uh, renal insufficiency. Her GFR is 40, which in, in most uh, cases, uh, even a GFR of less than 60, um, medical oncologists will be reluctant to give cisplatin. Um, but certainly at a GFR of less than 40, they're definitely not cisplatin eligible. So, Angie, how do you manage this patient? Cisplatin ineligible with aggressive yeah. muscle invasive tumor and hydronephrosis. Right. So um, I think, you know, in an ideal world, as you mentioned, I'd be giving uh, her chemotherapy. But um, what I do in these particular cases, especially if they have hydronephrosis, um, I take a good look at the way their kidney looks, um, the one that's hydronephrotic. If they have a pretty good parenchyma, uh, I would consider placing a percutaneous nephrostomy tube to see how much function we can get back. Um, and sometimes you can get someone who's borderline, um, to get to a point that they can receive chemotherapy. Uh, as you mentioned, the GFR of 60 is ideal, but they will give, um, many onco- medical oncologists will give platinum-based chemotherapy for a GFR of 50 if they use, you know, split dosing and some other techniques to, to get that there. So I would probably start with that. Um, yeah. But, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I, I, I want to, I like, we, we discussed this last time, and I think, Mm-hmm. It's worth just emphasizing placement of the nephrostomy tube. I think is a. If I had to choose between nephrostomy tube and stent, I prefer nephrostomy tube. Better mm-hmm. drainage, more confidence in yeah. drainage, doesn't cause irritation of the ureter. You know, uh, sometimes the ureter gets really stiff, and during the cystectomy, it's a little harder. So I definitely prefer the nephrostomy tube. 
Go ahead. I, yeah, I completely agree. In fact, I, I believe that so much that sometimes I pull the, pull the stent before the cystectomy just to give their ureter break because I found that that actually is more effective, especially if they can tolerate having it out. So um, I definitely, nephrostomy tube is my, is my go-to for most patients. Um, you know, in ter- terms of other treatments, so I think, you know, this patient's going to be moving forward with cystectomy. That's most likely going to be their best um, option here. Uh, you know, you have on the list on the slide type of urinary diversion, and I definitely think about a couple things in this patient, a 70-year-old woman. So uh, age is not necessarily a contraindication for a neobladder, but I do ask specific questions to figure out their function. Uh, of the, you know, we have some case series and retrospective studies looking at neobladder function among women, and in most of those, uh, predictor of poor function after neobladder, and by poor function I mean leakage, et cetera, is the presence of stress urinary incontinence uh, preoperatively. So I always ask that question. I think it's an important question to ask all your patients if you're considering neobladder. It can help kind of tailor the discussion and discuss benefits, risks, et cetera, when they're trying to make that very difficult uh, personal decision. Um, but the other thing about this particular patient is that her GFR, again, is 40. Um, when I have a patient who, have a, who has a creatinine of, two, uh, creatinine of two, a GFR about 40, um, I have a lot of concern about giving them a continent diversion. And so whether that be an Indiana pouch or a, um, or a neobladder, you do worry about that. If they have any protein in their urine, that's another way that you can check. So in this particular patient, I would, be, I would definitely be um, pushing her toward ileal conduit. Okay, yeah, terrific. So I agree. Um, and this, this particular patient uh, underwent a radical cystectomy. Uh, intraoperative frozen section of the left ureter is positive for carcinoma in situ. Um, so this is the situation. Now, some people don't take margins of the ureters. Some people take them and go all the way up until they get a negative margin. Other people do something in between. Um, Angie, what's your approach? What do you recommend? Yeah, this is a really um, good question because I think it's controversial, um, and and I I even have partners who do things differently at our own institution. Um, it's because the evidence is not strong, favoring one way or another. But um, personally, what I do is I do take a margin. I do recognize that there's a wealth of evidence that suggests that it it, it may not matter. Um, there's a big series out of, um, uh, um, I think it's, it's out of California, I'm trying to remember where, but they, um, they looked at over 2,000 cases and they didn't really find um, much in the way of association of negative or poor outcomes with frozen sections. But there's another series out of Mayo that they took a look at patients who had a negative um, frozen section, I'm sorry, a positive frozen section that was converted to a negative versus those who had a positive frozen section that they could not convert, meaning that they tried to get more proximal um, frozen sections, but um, at some point they had to stop um, in order to reimplant the, the ureter. And those patients had different um, recurrence rates. Um, as you might imagine, it was better, better prognosis for those who had the positive frozen converted to a negative. So I don't find, um, I don't find it that difficult to just get a frozen section I'll take maybe one or two more if it's, if it's comfortable and I feel like I can get a good ureteroenteric uh, anastomosis. But if I feel that's compromising the anastomosis, I stop because I do recognize there's not, you know, great evidence to suggest that it, it makes a big difference. Um, what do you do, Rob? Yeah, yeah I, I, I'm somewhere in the middle. And uh, generally I want to get a, a, an, an anastomosis of my ureter to my bowel segment without tension. Um, so I'm, I'm willing to go higher, and I'm, I'd really like to get a negative margin, um, but I do have a limit. Now, and, and now that said, if there's a tu- you know a patient with a tumor um, in the urine, I mean it's a clear, obvious tumor, and not, you know, then I think I, you know in that situation I'll, I'll go up and do a nephro U. But if it's this mm-hmm. kind of atypical, not sure the ureter actually looks grossly normal, then I'm, I'm not going to uh, um, you know compromise the good anastomosis to. To, to, to get a negative margin. Um, so I want to address, uh, before we go into the last case, um, there was a question posed by Jeremy about the use of um, biomarkers. 
to help guide decisions for neoadjuvant chemo. And you, you, so I'm going to, this is my kind of personal perspective here and, and uh, you know, uh, it's my opinion. So I, I caution people to say, you know, you, you, you'll see different biomarkers coming up. Um, and one that he mentions is using gene expression. There was a fairly large 300-plus cohort retrospective review of with these cohort of cystectomy patients where they use gene expression signature to identify um, basically subtypes of tumors that, um, first of all, had a poor prognosis or good prognosis, and then also trying to identify who may or may not respond to chemotherapy. And they, you know, are claiming that this new gene expression signature can be used to, to basically guide clinicians on who gets chemotherapy. So that's to me, is a little bit, um, uh, you got to be careful. The, the really, what you, to really show that an agent can help you in guiding decision-making, you need to do this in a randomized controlled trial and show that the agent did properly guide you in terms of improving survival. So what you really want to show is that use of this biomarker is going to provide an improved survival over no use of the biomarker. That's not what we see here. What we see here is an observational study where they analyzed the, the, the specimens and then correlated it with their outcome. They didn't actually show that using the biomarker improves the patient's uh, survival. So careful when you're, when you're basically saying, I'm going to take away chemotherapy, which we know works, which we have good data on. I'm going to take away that, that treatment for you um, based on this biomarker. So I, I caution you. I do think there is a, a trial right now called Coxin that's looking at using gene expression array in a prospective control trial um, with a randomization of uh, two different chem neoadjuvant chemotherapies. That is a step in the right direction, and um, I'm hopeful that we will be able to classify non-responders and responders moving forward, but I'm not convinced that we have anything right now ready for prime time. Angie, do you use anything right now, like any type of genetic test or biomarker to help you guide, um, you know, other than creatinine, to help you yeah. guide who gets neoadjuvant chemotherapy? No, I mean, I, I, think, I think you said it very well, Rob. Um, I don't think we have enough evidence to, to be using that at this point. So I, I don't, and my partners don't use that in our, our practice. Okay, well, why don't you take us through the last case? Sure, yeah. We have about six minutes, so I think uh, we can get through what we need to get through here. Um, we we so this, don't know. No I worries. We, we have can a always, little, uh, okay. extra time. So. <laughs> Great. Uh, so we have a 74-year-old male. This patient was referred to me. Um, he had undergone DCG uh, for CIS, but he recurred. He actually underwent, ended up going undergoing two induction BCGs with BCG maintenance, but a little less than a year later after his second um, BCG induction, he had another cystoscopy, showed CIS again. And this time the left UVJ, we, we, I couldn't identify. So, um, so I got a CT scan, um, and it showed left hydrourethronephrosis to the UVJ, which is concerning. You can see the left-sided hydro there. Um, this, uh, you can see the, this is the, let's see if I can use my arrow. Oh, actually, I think I put the arrows here. There we go. That, um, I'm going to take this off. Um, that arrow is pointing to the ureter. So you can see this hydro ureter all the way down. Um, but even more concerning was there was this questionable lymphadenopathy. You can see it right there next to the ureter. Um, you know, whether that was something inflammatory, I don't know, but um, certainly concerning. And we know that CIS can be a bad actor. Uh, so we, uh, for this particular patient, we decided to biopsy uh, this, this node. Uh, we didn't have any other signs of disease by the other this node, but it really was going to make a big decision on how we were going to proceed, whether we were going to do cystectomy or chemotherapy, et cetera. And um, the biopsy actually did confirm metastatic disease. Um, so we work in a multidisciplinary uh, setting, so our medical oncologist took a look at this patient, wanted a PET scan, um, mainly to understand whether their focus was going to be curative or palliative. Um, so they wanted to rule out distant metastatic disease, not just nodal disease. 
And um, this actually showed uh, no distant uh, disease, but did confirm um, these FDG avid left-sided um, pelvic sidewall lymph nodes. So the patient uh, was uh, was basically slated to undergo neoadjuvant chemotherapy or just chemotherapy, I guess you could say it. Um, and so we we talked about this earlier in this hour, but we got a left nephrostomy tube placed for drainage, ma- ma- basically to ma- maximize their drainage and improve their creatinine to its best. Um, we planned six cycles of gemcitabine and cisplatin with imaging that was supposed to be done after the third cycle. But unfortunately, and we have a lot of these patients, I'm sure, in our practices where they just don't get through chemo for one reason or another. And he just really had setback after setback. So first he had hematuria for his, from his nephrostomy tube. Then, then he ended up with thrombocytopenia. Then a week later, his um, ANC dropped and kept dropping. And um, essentially, with no improvement, uh, medical oncology sent him back to me for evaluation for cystectomy, which I think is appropriate here. Um, we tried to give him chemotherapy. Uh, he was just not getting through the chemo. And um, and so, you know, I just want to just very briefly um, mention the role of surgery in metastatic urethelial bladder cancer. You know, I think it depends on how you're defining metastatic. So in this particular case, this is nodal disease, no distant metastases. I think there's very good um, evidence that cystectomy is effective in those patients. In fact, you know, 20 to 30 percent of patients with clinical lymph node involvement can have a durable disease-free survival with a good um, cystectomy. Now, granted, these are patients who also get some chemo beforehand, et cetera, but, but I do think that there's good evidence out there to suggest that cystectomy is a good can't, a good option for patients, especially who are cisplatin eligible or cisplatin intolerant. Um, and so I think that that's, uh, that's one way to look at it. There's also another way to look at metastases as in distant metastases. And I would say that that's absolutely not standard of care right now. However, there are some series out of Japan and Germany where they are doing metastectomies for um, bladder cancer, and you can see um, – you know, good survival in some of these patients. Um, I don't, I, I think that in all of those series, there's no doubt that those with regional nodal disease, they do better than those with the distant metastases. But, um, but I think in the properly selected patients who can't get chemotherapy, may they're young, um, you know, it is an option. It's certainly not standard of care. Um, Rob, have you, have you experienced any of that? Have you, you know, done any metastectomies for patients um, like this, or have you done cystectomies with nodal disease? Yeah, yeah. so um, let me get my camera working here. Um, So, yes, and I think that as this this new era with the immune therapy is coming along and we're seeing more durable results, response rates, we're going to be seeing a lot more of this. Um, So I'm really glad you picked this case because um, Mm – you know, I'm in, in talking with, you know, colleagues, we're, we're, we're seeing more of this. We're doing more of these. Um, an isolated single lymph node in the pelvis, um, cisplatin, non-eligible patient, that, that typically gets a radical cystectomy in my practice. Now, um, multiple lymph nodes in the pelvis, uh, I think our test question has an example of, let's say, hypogastric, obturator. When you're talking about multiple regional lymph nodes, I think we can't argue that the standard of care would be systemic chemotherapy. But one of my um, – one of the patients that, that I felt like we did the most benefit for had a partial removal of the lung, had an extended node dissection, a cystectomy, and is alive three and a half years later. So I do think there's a role for uh, surgery in oligometastatic disease. Yeah. I agree, and I think I think that like you said we're going to see more of this um, in the, in the future. So for this particular patient, um, I did scan him before I took him for cystectomy, mainly to see if he had any progression of disease. And in fact, he actually had decrease in his left sidewall nodes, um, no evidence of distant metastases. Um, you know, we did see his ureter was looking a little bit better. Um, so I did take him for surgery, did an open radical cystoprostatectomy, and um, I actually do a lot of my cystectomies robotically. Um, that's just, a, you know, part of my practice. Um, but I also think that, um, 
you know, I'm very selective in who I decide to do robotics in and who I decide to do open with. And um, for this particular patient, I felt that he was better served with an open procedure given the, you know, the, the extent of his disease, nodal metastases, et cetera. And I was very, very glad that I did that. He had very, um, uh, he, he was very stuck at the left posterior wall. I had to kind of come at it at very, uh, various angles. It was really good to have the tactile feedback and make sure I got negative margins. His final pap came back as T4A and 2. And so, you know, at the last part of this case, I wanted to talk about next steps because, you know, now I have a patient, What I've already done what I can. Um, they've gotten, you know, they've tried uh, platinum-based chemotherapy. They weren't able to, to go through with that. Now they've had their cystectomy, but they have what we had confirmed, which is, you know, um, you know, no positive advanced disease. So what do we do next? Um, and again, this multidisciplinary clinic can be very helpful. We have um, two trials right now with chick, uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors. And so I wanted to just briefly mention that this is an option for adjuvant therapy in these kinds of patients who are cisplatin ineligible. So the Checkmate 274 is an anti-PD-1 monoclonal antibody versus placebo. And then the Invigor 010 is an anti-PDL1 versus observation after cystectomy. And they have very similar um, eligibility uh, and inclusion criteria. And so this is exactly what we ended up doing for this patient and preferred him for this. And I think that, you know, anytime you're, you know, you're talking and counseling your patient, they, they're listening to you in a sense that, you know, they don't know what's coming up next. It's, you know, it's, it's very difficult to navigate this really difficult journey. And these, this particular patient, and, and I have many others, you know, they have this, they have a really terrible time with platinum-based chemotherapy, and here they now have undergone cystectomy and, and, you know, going through all of the recovery from that, they're very hesitant to do anything further. And so I think it's important for us to talk about adverse events and how they may differ. Um, cisplatin, you know, has a very different um, adverse event profile compared to ch- immune checkpoint inhibitors. I think it's important to state that. Not to say that immune checkpoint inhibitors are free of any side effects. That's not true at all. However, um, the adverse events uh, appear to compare favorably compared to the platinum-based and cytotoxic regimen. So um, I think the, the, the important point here to make, and there was a whole webinar on this, so I'm only touching on this briefly since we're over time, but really the toxicity comes down to the autoimmune response. And so the most common side effects you're going to see are things like rash, the dermatitis, colitis in the form of diarrhea, hepatitis. Um, you'll see that in eleva- elevated LFTs and then certain endocrinopathies like hypophysitis. Um, and it's important to note that a lot of these and most of them are actually reversible if they're recognized and treated early with high-dose corticosteroids. So um, I think it's, you know, again, I just wanted to touch on this briefly, but for this particular patient, you know, to help navigate them through the journey, it's important to give them a, an idea how these treatments are differing, what their side effect profile is, and what they're going to tolerate. So um, he was willing to proceed knowing that it was, you know, a different kind of adverse event profile. He did not want to go through the same profile that he had already gone through, and that's understandable, but, you know, I think that, um, it's nice to have something else at our disposal now. Um, Rob, I don't know what you think in your practice, but it's been very helpful to us, and um, it's great to have something for adjuvant uh, therapy in patients like this. I agree 100%. I'm, I'm really uh, – I'm thankful that we have these trials open, and uh, we're really hopeful that there will be a positive effect because we need something for these patients in the adjuvant setting. So I agree. Thanks so much, Angie. So the first three webinars uh, in the AUA Bladder Cancer Educational Series is available complimentary uh, as webcasts or podcasts. So if you're unable to join us for these, I encourage you, uh, these took place in April, March, and June. You can find those at auanet.org forward slash BCA series to access them. Thanks, everyone, for joining us tonight. We hope you have a, uh, a nice evening.